this evening will come from either the revised, the hardback revised book or the supplement. The first one comes from the supplement, number 148, Father, help us raise our children. <clears throat> we'll sing all four verses. Do me so me little children from above said to us with joy and love bring a hope so Hardback book, um, How Shall the Young Secure Their Hearts, number 435. <clears throat> number 435 in the hardback book. Mm, do me so. How shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from singing? Thy word, thy choice and strolls in parts to keep the conscience clean, to keep the conscience That guides us all the day, and through the dangers of the night, I'll lag up to lead our way. I'll Let's take time to read and to pray. (coughs) 
The reading this evening will be from Job chapter 3. Job chapter 3, starting in verse 20, reading through the end of the chapter. This is Job's first speech, and he is, as he curses the day of his birth, he says in his anguish, Why is the light given to him who is in misery, and life to the bitter of soul, who long for death, but it does not come, and search for it more than hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly, and are glad when they can find the grave? Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, and to whom God has hedged in? For my sighing comes before I eat, and my groanings pour out like water. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. Let us pray together, please. Our dear holy God and Father, our Creator, the God who says, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. God, we come to you in prayer, humbly before your great throne, to thank you, Lord, for our lives, our health, our families. Thank you, Lord, for this church our leaders. Thank you for the peace that we're having right now where we live. And Lord, it's all because of you that we have these things. We always want to remember and know that all things that we have come from you and you alone and nothing of ourselves. Help us to not take things for granted and help us to remember that. But, Lord, we are so thankful for the greatest gift. And that's the gift of the forgiveness of our sins through the death of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our King. The death that he died for us. And the sacrifice that you made by giving your only Son. Help us, Lord, to live our lives each day. Keep Jesus Christ and his death in our memories in our minds as we go about our daily lives and remember that great sacrifice that he made for us so that we may not sin and that we may live perfect before you, being your children, being called your children, and let others see your light shine in us. Lord, as we're here this evening together as a group of God's people, we pray that you will bless each family and each one represented here. Be with the ones that are not Christians. Pray that something will be said or done that will spark them to want to obey the gospel. Pray that you'll be with Stephen this evening as he presents a lesson from God's word. Give his mind a readiness to present things. Give us ears to hear the words of truth that are being taught. And Lord, as as time goes on, life may become better, my life may become more difficult. We ask for wisdom, we ask for strength, we ask for courage, and knowledge and understanding of you and your will so that we can live our days pleasing in your sight and that we can live in a way that we can one day be with you for all eternity. Also in our prayer, Lord, we want to ask you to please be with those that are sick. There are several that are battling cancer and diseases that are life-threatening. 
And we have those that are just sick with colds. But you ask, ask you, Lord, to please heal them, comfort them, bring them back to their normal walks of life. We also have those, Lord, that have lost loved ones, specifically being with Eric John's family and the loss of his father. Pray that you will comfort that family any way that you can. Help us, Lord, to be a comfort to them. And, Lord, there are so many that we could mention in our, our families and our times that we ask you, Lord, please, just touch your healing hand on everyone that needs it and comfort us all. And Lord, as we continue through this service this evening, again, we pray that you'll help us have an open mind, be attentive, learn the things that are being taught so we can apply them to our lives, so that we can be better people each and every day. All these things, Lord, we pray in Jesus Christ, your Son's holy name. Amen. If you'd like to mark a songbook, our invitation song after the lesson will come from the big book. It's number 98, Take My Life and Let It Be. Number 98, and just by way of heads up, it, it, it's not an unfamiliar tune to us, but it's not, this is the one set to the, to, to the Mozart tune, not the one that we probably sing more often when we sing Take My Life and Let It Be. And we'll sing verses 1, 4, and 5 there. Before the lesson, remember who you are from the supplement, number 20, and if you'd like to stand with me, please do. <clears throat> do me do so in his image God created you in your birth he gave you life anew and his matchless love you now proclaim you must live to glorify his name Christian, remember who you are today Yes, you follow him up long the way Though the way seems dark and the journey far Strength comes when you remember who you are You were bought at such an awful price Christ redeemed you by his sacrifice You obeyed him and were free from sin Peace and hope and joy and love within Christian, remember who you are today As you follow him up Long the way, though the way seems dark and the journey far, strength comes when you remember who you are. Let your light be bright and ever true. If so, others will see Christ in you. In your life a sermon sinner see What the Christian life is meant to be Christian, remember who you are today As you follow him up along the way Though the way seems dark and the journey far Straight comes when you remember who you are. You might open up your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 30. We'll look there in just a moment. Appreciate Brad making the effort to pick songs out to go along with and support our topic this evening, but when a fella drops his oldest daughter off to go live somewhere else, then he doesn't want to come in and sing about raising little children the next evening. Actually, I do kind of want to sing about that, but just not when other people are watching. But they, they are songs that go along with our lesson uh, this evening. So we're going to be picking up on uh, a lesson that we laid some foundations for about a month ago 
talking about Christians and, and dating, courting, the business of a young lady and a young man finding each other and deciding to marry, and whatever you want to call that. Uh, over in Proverbs chapter 30, passage we began with last time, verses uh, 18 and 19, Solomon says, there are three things which are too wonderful for me. Uh, excuse me, this is not Solomon, this is the words of Agur. Three things which are too wonderful for me, four which I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, and the way of a ship in the middle of a sea, and the way of a man with a maid. There is, uh, I think, a level of admission that there's some difficulty uh, in figuring out how things work between men and women. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Uh, and yet, uh, Solomon and the other uh, wisdom writers here don't, uh, in that point, concede that there is no wisdom to be offered. Right? They're not saying it's confusing, and therefore we don't have anything to say about that. It is confusing, and therefore we need more wisdom about that, um, more attention given. I think this area falls into a category of things where the Bible does not give us a precise guidance, precise direction. I don't mean it gives us no guidance by any means, but it doesn't spell it out. And, say, and it doesn't say, here is how this process should work. Here's exactly what it should look like. Um, we, we do have wisdom to guide us, but we don't, we don't have precision. And so the easy thing to do in any um, subject that falls kind of into that category is to put up very broad fences where uh, we, we keep in place obvious moral teaching from God's word and then kind of say, really, anything you do within those broad fences is just fine. And, and then what we do is, I'm afraid, just look to the world around us for more specific guidance. I don't think that's healthy in most instances. I really don't think that's healthy when it comes to relationships between men and women. That the world would have um, more to offer us by way of specific guidance than God's word. I think God's word uh, should, should do more than just put the, the very broadest categories of restraint on us, but that it should help us to develop uh, specific mindsets, even if the Bible doesn't lay it all out in the rules, I think it gives us enough wisdom that we can, we can build specific guidelines for ourselves based on what God's Word says. Now, I'm not trying to build specific guidelines for you. I do have them for my house and for my children, and I think you do need to develop them for your children. I think the last thing that you need to do is to raise your children up to whatever age that you think that that is appropriate and then shove them out the door and say, be safe. But that, that's the very moment when maybe they need the most guidance. There are so many, there are so many things raging against good self-control and decorum at that moment in a young person's life uh, that they need most of all uh, the wisdom that their parents have to offer. What's particularly bad, I think, is when we delude ourselves into thinking that the way, that whatever the way we're doing it now is best. Now you might think, well, nobody thinks that. Some people do. But it's no better if we think that the way we did it 30 or 40 years ago is best. Uh, C.S. Lewis would talk about a, um, a chronological snobbery. He says people think that the moment they are living in is the best moment very often. That, you know, it's, it's all about progress. And so you will sometimes hear people say, I'm glad we don't live back in the time when they did this. And they'll say something like that without ever stepping back to think whether or not maybe that thing back there was better. Wisdom is always back there. You know, it's always in the reverse direction. Wisdom's not in the future. It is always in the past. From the moment we breathed, the very first man breathed, wisdom was back there in God's hands. And so the notion that we have discovered a, a way in the modern era to conduct relations between men and women that is better than what people have done in the past, um, it's, it's worse than just mere um, 
chronological snobbery, as C.S. Lewis would say, I think it's just a, a complete rejection of what God says about where wisdom comes from, how we find it, uh, which direction we search in. We ought to be going backwards to figure out how to do things best. And I don't mean just back to when our grandparents lived. I mean a long way farther back than that. Um, because I'll hear that even sometimes. Even our grandparents did this. Yeah, well, let's, 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 not, let's not let your grandparents be the era where everything was figured out. Um, let's let God's word be the arbiter of what is wise and what is unwise. Um, <clears throat> I also think that one of the things that keeps us from setting guidelines for ourselves is that we're afraid to make rules where God's word has not. We ought to be afraid of that. Um, that, that is something that I don't want to venture into, but that's, I don't want to make guidelines and rules for you, but I think God means for you to make them for yourself based on his wisdom. And I do want to make them for myself based on his wisdom. So as we're going along and you go, well, now you can't draw a hard line there. I can't. I can draw it in my house though. And I will. And you need to be drawing lines in your house knowing where they are, and especially letting your children know where they are. So let's not, in fear of making rules, leave out even guidance. What a shame if we do that. Well, let's begin uh, then this evening by talking about uh, the search, looking for a spouse. Um, there are some people who um, might say you don't even want to categorize it this way. You don't even want to think in terms of you're looking for a spouse. And they may uh, have mocking phrases towards people who are actively or even, you know, um, uh, uh, would, would admit, would just put it out there, yes, I'm looking for a spouse. Let me just say, there's absolutely nothing wrong with openly and clearly looking for a spouse. All through the scriptures, that's what's happening at the time that they go get, to get married. You, you don't have uh, in scriptures very often two people who just happen along uh, beside each other and, and, and hit it off at some, some friend's house or something, but that it is always a very purposeful thing when people go looking for a spouse. And so I think we have developed um, a sense that this needs to be a much more casual thing uh, than what it actually is. And I think we'd all be better off. In, in fact, what I think happens is there are many people who are looking for a spouse who go about being told they ought to pretend like they're not. And I, I think, why not just admit the obvious? Why not just be clear and say, yes, yes, I would like a spouse. Now, I'm not desperate. I'm not going to throw myself at the first person that comes along. We don't want to cultivate that kind of mentality but we do want to be honest about what's going on here. And much better to be honest and thoughtful and have our eyes wide open than simply plodding along and, uh, and just see what happens. Uh, again, that's not the picture that we have painted in Scripture. And so, have some purpose about this. And with that in mind, I, I, just, I just ask people, and I've asked this to a number of young people, who is it that you want to marry? Can you describe him or can you describe her? Can you tell me anything about them? And you say, well, I haven't met them yet. Well, when, how will you know when you do? If you don't know what they look like or what they act like or anything about them. And I think therein lies part of the problem. We don't have a picture of what it is that we want. And so we allow the picture to be formed outside of our minds. We, we allow it to just happen upon us, and then we sort of talk ourselves into maybe whatever is set before us as opposed to having an idea and actually pursuing, uh, in whatever measure that's appropriate, pursuing that picture. In Proverbs 31, if you're still there, Proverbs 31, notice at the beginning of the chapter, it says the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. And so these are the words of King Lemuel, but he is reporting to us the words that his mother taught to him. And so when we get to verse 10, the portion here that is more well known, an excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above rubies. And it goes on to describe this very industrious and virtuous woman. It is Lemuel's mother painting a picture of what a wife should be. 
Now, this is not Lemuel's wife. He sa- she is saying, here's what you should want. Here's what you should go after. Now, think about that. You cannot, um, you, you cannot see all of this in action before you get married, can you? There are qualities here, there, there are behaviors here that don't play out fully until you are in the bonds of marriage, and then uh, a woman would have an opportunity to behave this way. And so she's certainly not telling him, go out there, find a woman who behaves just like this, and marry her. She's already taken. But it is go find a woman who looks like she'll be this, right? Go, go find a woman who has characteristics that look like, that, that g- communicate to you that this is the kind of wife she's going to be. And we could do the same thing with husbands. And of course, really, some people say, why don't we have a passage uh, about this, like uh, like this about men? I would say, read the rest of the book. There's a lot (laughs) about what men ought to be and about how they ought to behave and what a wise man and a capable man and a hardworking man looks like right here uh, in this same book of Proverbs. And so you want to develop uh, that kind of picture. Um, this should not be uh, a mere um, consultation of your, your, your current culturally educated desires either. What I mean by that is um, if, if your picture is painted by the movies that you watch and the books that you read and the music that you listen to and all of that from a, from a simply cultural standpoint, then you could have a very problematic picture. What you want to do is not only paint that picture, but you want to come and bring it into comparison with what God's Word says. Because sometimes we do have some some kind of a picture of what we want. And then we compare it with God's Word and we find out that's not a very good thing to want. I think of, of young ladies who might want a man who is as sensitive as the, the, uh, current type of male heroes being presented uh, in, in film and so forth. You don't want a man who placates to you. You don't want a, a man who is not capable of leading but is a follower. Now, you may want it in the, in the um, immediate, but long term, that's not what you want for a family. And so, yes, paint a picture, but make sure that you're using God's word as your palette Uh, to put that picture together. So ladies should want a man that they can respect and follow because on the day that you commit yourself, if you are committing yourself by the pattern of God's word, what you're going to say is something like uh, that you vow to follow this man, to obey this man, um, to, to let him be the leader and the God in your home. So is this someone that, that can fit that bill? Too often, it, 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 um, the, the descriptions go like this. And, and again, not pre-descriptions, but descriptions once you're in a relationship and say, oh, I just, I just love him. He, he, he cracks me up. We, we get along so well together. We like all the same things. None of those things are problematic necessarily. But none of them speak to the core of what we're talking about here. We're not talking about somebody that you enjoy having late night text conversations with. We're talking about somebody who's going to guide your family for the rest of your life. So it needs to be a lot more substantive than just those kind of surface things that typically get spoken of. What a man wants to look for is a lady that he can cherish and who he can view as a trusted helper. Again, I hear guys say something like this. Oh, she just drives me crazy. I'm like, yes, she will. If that's it, if that's what you're saying, you know, that's the foundation of the depth of your relationship. That's not going to get it, buddy. This is somebody that you want to be able to walk away with your children in her hands knowing that she is is, uh, guiding them in all the ways that you want them guided in. That you can um, hand over the checkbook to and know that she's going to be a, a good manager and keeper of the resources that you're bringing into the home. I hear guys, you know, make out their descriptions and they they talk about the kind of girl that they want and it has nothing to do with managing the home. And then when they get married, they say, we have to to keep separate checking accounts. Well, why is that? Well, it's because you you didn't look at Proverbs 31 or any other biblical passage when you were thinking about what it is that you wanted in a wife. 
So when you're making a search, well, have a sketch of what it is that you're searching for. Well, along those lines, what about, what about those who have another faith? I take that uh, phrase loosely from Galatians chapter 1, where he talks about another gospel. And what does Paul say about another gospel there? He says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who, dis who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from, from heaven should preach, uh, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And as we have said before, and so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. And then somebody reads that and says, yes, but is it okay to date him? I mean, I, what do you think Paul would say? Here's a man who preaches a different gospel, and you want to know if it's... And, and Paul says, hey, let that man be accursed. And you say, but, but is it all right if we, if we go out? Would it be all right if we got married? It doesn't sound like Paul has that in mind when he says, you know, get, put all the distance you can between yourself and these false teachers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and in verse 14, a passage we come to when discussing this from time to time. It says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will, dwell in, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. Now, somebody might say, now listen, what he's talking about here is the kind of relationships, business partnerships, things of that nature in which you get entangled with someone, and, uh, and so you want to be careful about those kinds of relationships. So you think then that Paul would be less concerned with the most uh, solid entanglement that you can possibly get in in this life. And he would say, under those circumstances, by all means, don't worry about it. It's fine. Yoke yourself right up. Now, if, if Paul is worried about relationships that you can get out of, how much more do you think he might be worried? It's almost like an assumed how much more do you think you'd be worried about relationships that you are committing to for life? Now, obviously, people will quickly go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and say, look, here's the case uh, where uh, you've got uh, someone who is married to an unbeliever, and he says, do not separate. And so, obviously, if you do marry, then that must not have been a sin because the solution is not divorce. Well, let me just say that, number, number one, just because the solution uh, is not divorce doesn't mean that sin wasn't involved in getting into the relationship. So somebody can pursue a relationship in which they have sinful attitudes all along the way. The marriage itself is not what's sinful, necessarily. But very often it can be the attitude that got you there that was problematic. And that may be what you need to repent of. But let me also say this. Paul doesn't paint any kind of picture of some, it's something that you want to get into in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In other words, what Paul is dealing with in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is the problem of people who have ignored, uh, either ignored advice or more likely come to Christ having already been in that situation. And now he's saying, look at the problems and let me tell you how to deal with the problems. And so... You marry an unbeliever. Maybe there's someone here who married an unbeliever. Maybe you married an unbeliever and now they're a believer. Wonderful. But what Paul is saying is that here are problems that come along with that. And what I would say is that is never a, a, a decision that is made from a spiritually minded foundation. Right? There are other things at play when uh, a Christian goes and pursues romantically a non-Christian. And, uh, and so, 
that needs to be strongly taken into consideration. It, it is interesting to me as I've read a number of um, things trying to prepare these lessons. And I was reading a book by um, a woman who is a Presbyterian. And uh, some of my brethren get so touchy when we start talking about this subject. I wish you would read what some denominational people have to say. This woman, she went through and said, why, don't, why would you possibly want to do that? And it wasn't just make sure they believe in Christ. She said there's a lot of people that say they believe in Christ. And she went on to say make sure they believe in infant baptism. And make sure that, you know, in other words, make sure because one day you're going to have kids. And then what are you going to do? And I thought, here's this Presbyterian woman that is willing to be a lot stronger on this point than some of my brethren. And what is the problem? And, and I wonder if it's that uh, um, sometimes our convictions are not as strong as they need to be. And, uh, and they need to be stronger, and we need to recognize that what we're doing is entering into a relationship that, that we are automatically introducing strife and, and anxiety about the most fundamental aspect about who we are. You know, I, there are people that are going to end up getting married, uh, and there are going to be points of contention that are still heated but much less than this. And let me say this. If those points of contention are more heated than this, well, there's your problem. That something else would be more difficult to overcome than this, that should never be. That this should be the most fundamental thing uh, that we want to reconcile uh, between uh, ourselves and anyone that we're pursuing. And especially, I mean, it could go either direction and it can pull in either direction, but for a woman to, to uh, approach a man and say, I want you to lead me, and he's not even on his way to the eternal destination that you want to be at. Where are you following him? Where is he taking you? And the only answer is you can't fully follow him uh, if he's not a Christian. Well, what about preferences on your list? So we talk, we, we're talking about spiritual qualities. We want a, a picture that, that God approves. But what about those... Um, preferences where we might we might put something down and say uh, somebody says oh that's superficial you know that that's just uh, you're concerned about looks or you're concerned about uh, things that don't matter you know I want him, I want him to be interested in this or I, I would like to marry a, a woman who who has these similar interests at me and none of that matters so long as you're both Christians throw all that to the side but I, I want to say this um, in defense of of those kinds of preferences. Over in uh, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 11. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 11. It says of Abraham that it came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, see now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. A couple of verse, verses later, it says it came about that when Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. That's a descriptor that gets used over and over throughout the book of Genesis in reference, for the most part, to women. Over in chapter 29, it even has a, a comparative element to it. Over in Genesis 29 and verse 17, it says, Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful of form and face. I think that in our, our desire for everything to be equal, for everybody to be on the same plane, and, and it only to be about spiritual qualities, because spiritual qualities are something that anybody can develop. We don't want to have there, there to be any comparisons that are, that are on the surface uh, where somebody could be considered as, as superior or better than anybody else. And so we... We say things like, you know, they're, they're, that's not real beauty. I don't know what to tell you, but that Abraham saw, saw something exterior about his wife and said, this is beautiful. And it wasn't just him. The Egyptians backed him up and said, yeah, she's beautiful. And this is the divine. This is Moses with inspiration saying Rachel was better looking than Leah. I hear people come along and say, you know, I mean, well, by, by whose standards? Well, obviously the inspired writers. Right? That's not just, 
That's not just some notion out there that has no basis in reality. So, you got a young man, he says, this is the kind of girl that I'm attracted to. Now, can he take that too far? Obviously. But there's nothing wrong with it. And I think sometimes we get our feelings all um, wrapped up and torn up, uh, and, and especially when our children are involved, and we're very protective and possessive, and then, and then some boy isn't interested in my girl, and who does he think he is? Well, I'm, listen, if he, if he doesn't think my girl is the best thing in the world, then buddy, find somebody else. I want somebody who thinks she is it, and, and that's okay if he doesn't. So Deuteronomy chapter 21, to offer a little bit of balance here, There are going to be surface things. There are going to be humor elements, uh, personality things. Incidentally, I, I don't think that what it's meaning is Abraham looked at his wife and said, you have a great personality. And I think the Egyptians will recognize that. That's not what's happening there. God recognizes that there are those differences. But over in Deuteronomy 21, notice what he says here. When you go out into battle against your enemies and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands and you take them away captive and you see among the captives a beautiful woman and have a desire for her and would take her as your wife for yourself, then you shall bring her home to your house and she shall shave her head and trim her nails and she shall also remove the clothes of her captivity and she shall remain in your house and mourn her father and mother a full month. And after that, you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. So this is an interesting uh, instruction here. Here they are. They're in battle. They're taking captives. And one of the soldiers sees a woman, and he is attracted externally. Obviously, he doesn't know anything else about her. But she, she looks like the kind of woman that he wants. What does God say? He says, I want you to take her home and shave her head. Now, that may sound like cruelty, but I think what it is is precaution. He says, you take her home and you shave her head off and you put her in mourner's clothing for a whole month. And at the end of that month, I think the idea is at the end of that month, you still want to marry her all right. But what he didn't want is young men going out, finding a girl uh, in the midst of battle and the heat of all of that and taking her and taking her to himself and then being tired of her very quickly. And then now she's off and out of the house. God is providing protection for this young lady. So write down your preferences. Be attracted to who you're attracted to. That's all well and good. But think past that. Maybe... Maybe go see what she looks like when she's been outside sweating for a little while. That's, you know, that's what I always say in our family. We met all our spouses at camp. It's a great opportunity. If you're still attracted, well, then good. But it's not always going to be her in her best moment. And so make sure you see him or her in their not best moments. And see if you stay attracted. Don't just go after the skin deep. God's word does not condemn beauty. It, it just says, don't let it stop at the surface. Make sure it goes all the way down to the heart, to the very core. So, preferences are fine. Now, ask this question. Are you the kind of person that the kind of person you just described would be interested in? That's really where you've got something that you can do here. Because a lot of times we start talking about this, somebody says, well, I'd love to get married, but I just don't know where he's at. Or I don't know where she's at. Well, what can you do? You can work on becoming the kind of person who would attract that kind of person. Because a lot of times people make out the list, and that list, you kind of read it, and you go, whew, kind of shooting for the stars here, aren't we? Maybe you should work on getting yourself up in the stars if you're going to, demand these kinds of things. Um, I know that not everybody's like that. But I think sometimes we have much higher expectations on the other end of the stick than we do on this end of the stick. 
and we expect them to have all of these things being developed, but maybe we don't expect ourselves to be developing those kinds of qualities. So, if you are a young lady who wants the kind of young man that God's Word describes as the kind of capable leader in the home that he ought to be, one of the things that you're going to have to do is, um, is really go against the grain of culture. You're going to have to be able to read passages like Proverbs 31 or, or what Peter has to say about women being the weaker vessel without flinching at that. I heard a young lady uh, one time talking about she thought she'd get married one day, but she wasn't going to sit around and be a princess uh, for some prince to come along and rescue. And I said, well, don't worry. No princes will come. They don't want any part of that. As far as I know, none have. And so you go along and you make yourself um, as, um, as rebellious against God's order as the culture around you, then all the men who want that will keep clear of you. So you show yourself to be that capable manager of the home that Lemuel's mother is describing. Men, likewise, there are a lot of a lot of attracting that you can do without being the man that God wants you to be, but you want the woman that God describes here, then you're going to have to be the kind of man that God describes, which means you've got to avoid two extremes. You've got to avoid the sort of true toxic masculinity, that, that masculinity that um, is abrasive and domineering, uh, that is arrogant and full of pride, but then you've got to uh, avoid the opposite reactionary extreme, which is always apologetic and stooping and, and not courageous, but cowering and, and yielding to every pressure that this world has to offer. So there's work to do uh, for those who are interested in looking for somebody and have a have somebody in mind, have a picture in mind of who they're looking for. Well, once we do find uh, a prospect, if we could use that language, now what? There are some rules of engagement. I know that's military language. Maybe that's not so inappropriate. Um, it does seem uh, like war tactics sometimes. What are the rules of engagement that we should consider from God's Word? I think, first of all, Men ought to be the ones to pursue women. Now, um, when, when I tell my girls, don't you be the one to call, you wait till he calls you. Now, used to, that meant wait till he comes to your house. Now, it means all sorts of things. But he initiates, not you. People think, well, that's, that's old-fashioned. It is. But it's much more old and much more fashioned in the sense of we are fashioned this way than people realize. This isn't just, just a, a Victorian notion. This is a creation notion. That it is the man who is in the lead and it is the woman who is responsive to his lead. Always the Bible speaks in terms like Genesis chapter 28 and in verse 1 and 2. Genesis 28, when it says, Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise and go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there take yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. It is always you take a wife. Nobody's ever saying to a woman, go take you a husband. But it is always go take a wife. And, and so it is always by that initiative. It is always in that direction. I think sometimes, like, I know there are people who think this only from an old-fashioned way. Like, that's the way we grew up back in the, uh, the black and white days. That's just the way that we did things. And, and that's not why. It's because there are biblical realities about who we are. And you can teach your children to submit to those realities or you can teach them to rebel against those realities. And I think this is a small, it's a very small way, but it is a way that what we're doing is teaching our children to submit to those realities. You're the one in the lead. Now, 
I understand that what we're doing is creating a generation of uh, young men and young women who um, apparently are afraid to talk on the telephone. I've heard this is a thing. Like there's an actual phobia. I don't want to talk on the phone. I don't want to, I don't want to initiate conversation and so forth. And, uh, and so what I hear is that we need to figure out how to deal with this. Well, I got a way to deal with it. You don't let your kids turn out that way. You make them talk to people. You make them initiate conversation. And, and, just, and somebody might say, well, my boy's so shy. If, 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 if somebody doesn't ask him, he's never going to get asked. Well, I'm going to tell you what, he's just never going to get asked if he's in my house. Because that's, that's, that's not the way we're going to play the game. I, I want it to look, I want him to look like God's man, not like the world's man. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean ladies are entirely passive. You need to be relatively passive. In other words, you're not the initiator. You're not the one who uh, is uh, taking charge of the situation. But I think we all know that there are... Um, there are ways about um, making yourself noticed that are not inappropriate. And then there are ways that are inappropriate. Uh, one fellow said, what you want to be is attractive, but not an attraction. You, you want to, to present yourself in a way that attracts the right kind of attention without attracting the wrong kind of attention. Ruth chapter 3 is the chapter where Naomi gives advice. I'm not certain about the nature of Naomi's advice. I do know, uh, I do feel like I know more about Ruth's reception of it, that advice. And what she is trying to do is discreetly grab the attention of Boaz. And I think the only issue is with Boaz is not that he is not a man of strength and character. He is certainly that. He is not a man who presumes that Ruth would be interested in him. And I think that plays out. You know, he's, he thinks, you would want me? Uh, and of course, I think Ruth thinks the same. I mean, here she is. Who is she that Boaz might want her? So Ruth's mother, or mother-in-law, Naomi, counsels her to put herself in a discreet position to grab, um, to grab the attention of Boaz. He is the kind of man that they knew he was. He maintains that discretion and, of course, is responsive uh, to those attentions. It's, it's fine to pay attention to a boy and, uh, and to even be encouraging to some degree. Uh, but always in the midst of that, what you want is to understand that your part is the greater part of discretion because you are not running the show. If you are the one who has to take initiative to get your relation started, it is very likely you will continue to have to be the one that takes initiative. And that is not the good foundation of a relationship. Rebellion against God's created order is not the way to start things off. What we want to do is fall into line with that and have a relationship that can be built uh, on the premise that we start off uh, following that pattern. Well, along those lines then, uh, restraint is an element that ought to characterize uh, relationships between young men and young women and even older men and older women, as the case may be. Over in Proverbs chapter 4, Proverbs chapter 4 and in verse 23, he says there, watch over your heart with all diligence, for, for, for from it flow the springs of life. I'm afraid that here, here's where we really, we set these broad boundaries, and we, we say anything goes up to, you know, this point of sexual morality, right? We're going we're gonna to put fences around so that you don't go to the point of sexual morality, but really anything else that you want to do is... Fair game. I think there's so much more involved in intimacy than sexual intimacy. And there's so much more given away in a relationship, a good relationship, a marriage relationship, than sexual intimacy. Sexual intimacy is the culmination and it is the representation of the depth of that intimacy, 
but it is only a representation. See, that's the point I think Paul is trying to get across over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 16 when he's talking about sexual immorality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 16 when he says, Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. And so what he's saying is, here are people uh, um, joining themselves to temple prostitutes. And he says, there is never a casual way to go about that. More is involved than you realize. You're giving away more than you realize. And I think sometimes we coach our children in the standpoint of like, the physical is the only thing you must restrain yourself from giving away. But there's so much emotional part of you that you are giving away as well. And that you will be just as sorry and ashamed to have given away. It's not just when you go that far. I think about what Jesus says with regards to adultery. And, uh, and, and he pulls back and he says, it's not just going all the way to the very act. Let's back it up to the things that lead there. We teach our children to show restraint only in the moment where they're about to cross over. But what about all the steps it took to get there? I think with regards to this, that when, when you enter into a, a relationship in, in Scripture, we talked about this last time, there are no romantic relationships in Scripture that are not headed towards marriage or sin. Right? There, there's not a category for casual romantic relationships. And in Scripture, what you have is commitment all along the way. And in fact, not just in Scripture, but really throughout most of history. Until the modern era, ro romantic relationships always involved commitment. Right? So go, I mean, just for an example, go read a book from the Victorian era. Right? Go read some Jane Austen or... or uh, something of that nature. And so what you have is the moment attention start getting paid, what people want to know is, what are your intentions? And the man either says, yes, I intend to pursue you for marriage, or no, I was just fooling around, in which she tells him to go on his merry way if she knows her business. But what you don't have is this situation where people don't know where they stand. Or if you do have that, that's the tragedy. I know it's not scripture, but if you've got daughters, go read Sense and Sensibility, and you want your daughter not to be Mary Ann. You don't want her to be the one who gives, it, gives herself away, not sexually, but emotionally, to everybody that comes along, and what she ends up is in shambles at the end of the book. But she, she doesn't maintain herself. And her sister over there goes through the pains of maintaining herself. And when a man finally comes along who says, yes, I'm interested, then she gives vent. And she is the happy one. She is the sensible one. And that's what we want is sensible children. Now, they're not sensible because they are teenagers. No offense. It's just the nature of it. So you have to be. You have to help them be sensible and be restrained and hold back and not give away what ought not to be given away. And what I constantly want to tell my children is this. It's something Amy and I talk about. I said, what advice would you give? She said, conduct yourself in a way so that if this thing ends before you get to commitment, nobody's embarrassed. You don't have any problem seeing each other after that relationship is ended. Now, I know you say, well, there's going to be some awkward. Yeah, but the kind that passes real quick. Not the kind that you see them 20 years later and you've got to walk the other direction. Because I know people like that. Without even, again, giving away the physical, they just gave too much of themselves. And so it's hurtful and painful, and it's roads they don't want to go back down anymore. I wish we could go back to the place where once we entered into courtship, we were already saying what we're pursuing is marriage. That doesn't mean we got there yet, but if you break it off, that was, big, that was serious business. But what we've done now is we've entered into relationships where a boy and a girl can go out and neither one of them are either, even sure if it's a date or not. I, teach my, I want to teach my girls. I want them to know that if a boy says, let's go do this, you better know. 
Of course, I better as well. But you better know what's going on. If I say, what's happening between you and this young man? I don't know. Well, let's figure it out. Because we're not, we're not playing games here. And there's no room for, uh, at, at least biblically, there's no room for that kind of um, ambiguous relationship between young men and young ladies. Well, one other bit here to include, and that is that wise precautions will prevent... Uh, bad appearances, but also bad behavior. John chapter 3 and verse 19 is this well-known comparison of what is evil and what is true. He says, um, this is the judgment. This is Jesus speaking. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Romantic relationships of unmarried people ought to be conducted in the light of day. Now, I mean that somewhat literally, but, but also figuratively. That everything's just out in the open. We, we talk about privacy, right to privacy. I, I, I just want to scream when a parent says, well, you know, they, just, they deserve their privacy. They, they deserve no such thing. And what's more, it's not good for them. To have a young man and a young lady having a private relationship, that's called marriage. And before marriage, it's a very public relationship. And it ought to be as public as possible. And so as you're going along, um, you know, um, we're not at the house. Well, then my daughter and a young man are not going to be there by themselves. He, maybe he's got his own place. Well, then you're not over there. You see, because we're going to conduct this thing as publicly as possible. And my public eye is going to be on it, but so is everybody else's. And that's just fine. That's for your benefit and everyone else's benefit. And we can all be confident about what's happening here. And let me just say, the more that you don't want that, the more I'm going to demand it. Because the more I'm scared about it. What is it that you don't want to be out there in public? We just want some time to ourselves. Well, and then let's go to the courthouse. And if, if you don't want to do that, then you're not ready for time with yourselves just yet. So the light of day, it keeps rumors at bay, but it also keeps uh, our own. You know, that's, that's the problem. We have too much confidence in ourselves. We have too much confidence in our children. And somebody says, well, I want to have confidence in my children. I, I understand that, but not to the point of stupidity. I want to understand their limitations. They're people. They're young people with raging hormones. And so I want to help them as best I can to keep the devil at bay. Light does that, and darkness does not. And so help them keep that in the light of day. Well, I, I know I haven't given... Maybe as much specifics as some would like. Maybe I've given more than some would like. I hope that what we see here is that there's a lot that God's word would guide us into and that it would keep us away from. That he does give us a path to travel that would keep us away from the entanglements and from the pitfalls that the devil throws in our way. That the Proverbs describes as it goes through chapter 7, for instance, it says, here's what that road looks like and here's where it ends up. We can't give the last word on this because God hasn't. He hasn't said, here's the end all be all. Here's the precise prescription. But we can be guided. And we can certainly reduce, I believe, the amount of heartache and regret that so often goes along with these relationships for our children and for everybody else's as well. I hope that we would want that. And I hope that if you're here this evening and you're not a Christian, that, again, you would recognize that any relationship that you try to build is one that is being built without the most fundamental element that ought to be there. That is God and his word and his guidance. He is the one who created marriage. People say, I want to have a happy marriage. Then you better have God there. Because ultimately it can't truly be happy without him. If you're here this evening and need to render obedience to him, we invite you to do that. If there's any way that we can assist you, 
uh, won't you come forward while, you, while we stand and while we sing. Yeah. 